Hmm, fascinating. Mm hmm. <laughs> Would you look at that? Hmm. <laughs> you don't say. Look. Wonder what all this means. Oh yeah, that one's gonna be a beauty. You know, it's interesting how in our age of technology, everything is becoming lighter, thinner, faster, more efficient, and the same holds for gardening. Particularly as demonstrated in urban farming techniques in small spaces. So today we're exploring the small details that make big impact. From tiny flowers to compact living spaces, I'm going to show you how to enjoy the little things. Nano means small, really small. In fact, the word nano is a prefix that means billionth, billionth of a meter. So like a nanosecond would be a billionth of one second and a nanometer would be billionth of one meter. So if I were to break this meter stick into a billion pieces, each one would be one nanometer wide. My name is Kevin Delaney and we're at the Museum of Discovery in Little Rock. Now, we can't see nanometer sized things with our eyes, but Properties of materials change when it gets that small. So let's look at gold, for example. Gold, as we know, is a sort of a yellow, soft metal. It doesn't really conduct heat very well, but nanoparticles of gold, once you get down to the, that size, their properties change. So gold not only conducts heat very well, it changes color from sort of a yellow to red and orange. And this is nothing new. For years and years, stained glass artisans have been using gold to create these colors and silver to create green and blue. There are actually researchers who are working with nanomedicine to try to use nano gold uh, as a cancer treatment because you can create these small structures because again, once we're able to you know, move mat material around on that scale, we can make all kinds of things, including uh, these kind of like little shark cages almost for cancer cells, so you can heat up the cell directly without having to radiate the entire body. That's possible. I have some hot water here. Uh, I'm gonna pour it right into this beaker. Now my wire, as you can see, it's a spring shape. It used to look like this, but now it's all sort of stretched out. But because it's made of nanoparticles of tin and nickel, it can do something kind of amazing. Let's see that again. Wow. If you were to look at a blue morpho butterfly, for example, it, to us it looks blue. If you were actually to look at those, those, those little structures on a butterfly's wings, you see that it's reflecting light in a different way, and they're actually brown. Believe it or not, if you look at it under the right light, a blue morpho butterfly is actually brown. Now, nanomaterials are also capable of manipulating light in different ways. So I have something here. If, if we look into this beaker, we see kind of a red, kind of ornament looking thing, sort of like a, a chocolate kiss. If we look in here, we see a clear one. But look carefully, because if we were to lift this out, we might find something kind of surprising. This is a nanomaterial called borosilicate glass. This is baby oil. Borosilicate glass and baby oil kind of react a little bit strangely to each other, where the light doesn't quite go around, but go through. So it kind of masks our other ornament pretty well. So with materials like this, scientists are able to create invisibility materials. So the invisibility cloak might not be too far off, but be careful, use invisibility wisely. Seems like these days, everyone's becoming a little more environmentally conscious, thinking about the choices that they make even down to tiny houses. And I don't mean doll houses like this. The tiny house movement encourages people to scale down in favor of more economic and environmentally conscious places to live. 
Not sure living small is for you? Well, in some places, you can try it before you buy it. What do you think, little guys, huh? We originally just wanted to increase our garden area and grow some chickens, and one thing led to another, and here we are in a 269 square foot tiny home. We're in the living room right now. We've got nine foot ceilings, but they vault up um, into a dormer light. We did several things with the tiny home in order to make it feel bigger. For one thing, this is actually a miniature love seat. We put lots of windows in it, and we like to keep the blinds open uh, so that people can get an infinity feeling. Uh, we chose the color white because white is seamless and gives things a bigger feel. You don't feel as boxed in. There's far less space that you have to clean, uh, far less space that you're going to have to maintain, uh, far less space that you're going to have to heat and cool. With the cost of a tiny home, if you did have to take out a mortgage, uh, even though the, the entire cost of this home is, is likely what most people pay for you know, a newer vehicle today, so you could own your own home and have your own micro farm for what most people are gonna pay for their SUV. And so we're in the bedroom now. This is just over 70 square feet, um, which gives us just enough room for a full-size bed, place to store your stuff. We've got a couple of uh, built-in on-wire cabinets. These several shelves up here, uh, a place to um, hang your clothes, as well as several drawers with uh, plenty of space. So we're on the other end of the house where the kitchen is, and again, it's, it's relatively a full-size kitchen short of the dishwasher. Uh, you have your refrigerator, you have a sink, stove, microwave. We have uh, a lot of different uh, fruit in the front. Uh, and then in the back, we've got the raised garden beds and the chicken coop. Um, so just all different ways of taking 1,800 square feet of lot space, putting a home on it, and then being able to also reap the benefits of having a very micro urban farm. Uh, just a very eco-friendly, sustainable way to live. While living tiny, you do lose um, a lot of storage space, but you gain uh, more freedom in that you have more money to spend in experiences. It's kind of just human nature that no matter how much space we're given, we're gonna fill it up. And we always think that we need a bigger home. If we just had a little bit more space, then it would be enough. Enough is always just whatever you say it is. And so for, for some people, not for everybody, a tiny home is enough. Sometimes it's the little things that make all the difference in decorating. You know, one of the things I say, Jay, all the time is, you know, when you've got gorgeous foliage, who needs flowers? And I really love foliage arrangements. It's such a great way for us to enjoy something that's gonna be long lasting. Yeah. And you have so many great foliages here. Yeah. I love a burning bush. Yep. That's that good? beautiful. Yep, and you know, it'll change colors over the course of the fall. A great English designer once said, remember, green is a color too. Absolutely. You know, and so there's a lot of different greens. And I love the different textures that we can get, because if we use the evergreens in there, mm -hmm. and then the variegated, now I call this Wagelia. Mm -hmm. and well, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we call it Wagelia. 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 That's yeah. perfect. Mm -hmm. well, and then, this is a variegated form, and I really like it. So, I oh, like it's this, so pretty. this gold edge to it, yeah, so it makes it pop a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Well, this is one of our magnolias called Bracken's Brown Beauty, and, it, and what I love about it, it has this beautiful velvet brown underside of the leaf, which is really right. quite handsome, I think. So anyway, you saw the, the fruit pot of the southern magnolia. What are you thinking there? I think that that's going to kind of be a focal okay. point for us. Yeah. And we'll cut it a little bit shorter. You know, a lot of people think of foliage arrangements as being kind of something for the holidays, because, you know, you've got holly, you've got evergreens, but you use these all year round. I do, because I think, you know, it's a great basis for having something living in the house. Sure. And then- And it'll last a long time. It lasts a long time. And then I can add a couple flowers if I want to. Right. And once those flowers have expired, I still have a beautiful arrangement. This uh, Cheyenne Skies grass really caught your eye, I noticed oh. out in the garden. A couple flowers, maybe? Sure. Do, so these hydrangeas. 
Well, and you know, what we have here is, you know, late in the season, because you can see the grasses are late in the season, you begin to see this sort of aging or uh, senescence with the, with the blooms, which I actually like. Yeah. I think they're pretty. So what are you thinking here? You want to use some of the greenish pink ones? Or? I think I'll, I will use a greenish pink one inside there. And you know what? It can be as simple as one. Yeah. Because we'll just accent it off to the side. Yeah, look at that. With that magnolia. It's very handsome. And all natural gathered from the garden. Perfect. Yeah, look at that. Jay, thanks for sharing your perspective on foliage and flowers with us. Well, and thanks for having me. It's just such a treat. Well, it's a pleasure having you here. My name is Alexis Jones, and I am a chef, and I've been working in restaurants for over 10 years. Alan and I got together and we wanted to use saffron and cardamom to show how a little bit of an ingredient can go a very long way. So we came up with doing a, a pumpkin cinnamon roll. Well the first step is roasting the pumpkin and it takes about 15 to 20 minutes at 375 degrees. We put it over some rosemary to add a little bit of extra rosemary flavor and give a little more savory note. The next step was to toast the spices. So we used clove, cardamom, and nutmeg, as well as ground cinnamon and some fresh ginger that we grated into the pan. And just toast it for a few minutes until it's fragrant. After it's done toasting, I just put it straight into a coffee grinder and ground it until it was fine. So for the pecans, I started with whipping egg whites until they are frothy. Um, I took saffron and soaked it in a little bit of water to help it bloom and develop its flavor and toss that in with the egg whites, also the chai spice, and then we fold it in the pecans and finish with a little bit of brown sugar and cinnamon. Put it into the oven about 325 degrees for 15 to 20 minutes. By the time your pecans are done, your pumpkin should be finished roasting. So you want to take it out of the oven and scoop the flesh out and then put it in the food processor with a little bit of butter and salt until it's completely whipped together. I usually use about an ounce and a half of unsalted butter. I used a basic yeast dough recipe and uh, brewed a little bit of chai tea for it. Uh, first thing you need to do is bloom your yeast. So take your packet of yeast and uh, three-fourths cup of very warm water. You want to add a little bit of sugar as well into that because the yeast will eat it and it'll help them grow. Let it sit for about 10 minutes for the yeast to get frothy. And in a standing mixer, you're gonna add three cups of all-purpose flour and let that start for about 10 minutes coming together. It'll form a bit of a ball, but it'll still be uh, dry. And add a fourth of a cup of chai tea and two big tablespoons of the pumpkin butter, as well as a pinch of salt and let that form a ball and uh, knead for a few minutes. After you knead it, you want to put it in a bowl. Cover it with uh, plastic wrap and let it rise. It takes about 30 minutes. And um, then you'll take it out and you'll punch it down again and put it back in the bowl and let it rise 10 more minutes. While you're waiting on your dough to rise, it's a good time to make your cream cheese icing. So start with room temperature cream cheese and butter. And with a paddle attachment in the mixer, you want to get that creamed until it adds a little bit of air in it. I added some chai spice as well to that and then about half a cup of powdered sugar and um, a little bit of heavy cream, vanilla to taste, just a teaspoon. So when the dough's ready, you want to put it on a floured surface and roll it out to um, about a half of an inch to a quarter inch thickness, depending on your preference. I like to roll it out and turn it over to make sure both sides are floured and aren't going to stick to the board. I chopped up some of the pecans for the filling. Uh, after it's rolled out, you want to spread a good layer of the pumpkin butter. Finish it with some brown sugar and cinnamon, enough to coat the entire surface, and then the pecans. And then you take it from there, and you will fold it over itself and roll it, um, being careful to keep an even distribution. Once you roll it up, you want to make sure that you pinch the edges and the sides so that they all stay together, and then um, slice it. So after you roll it and slice it, you want to take it straight to the cast iron skillet and it'll go into the oven at 375 for 
15 minutes. Um, I like to take it out and add a little bit of butter and pecans on top of it. Uh, the butter will help it brown and then just go back in the oven for two minutes. So smear the cream cheese frosting on top of it, garnish with some more pecans and then you're ready to serve. Sometimes the tiniest little blooms can pack the biggest punch. They can be quite a surprise, particularly when they're delivered in multitude. And when they constellate with other flowers, you can see here, these tiny little blooms juxtapose these petunias are the perfect contrast of the tiny to the large. These little micro flowers, if you will, really set off the larger flowers. One of my favorites is Lobularia. This one's called White Knight. You can see how dense it is. It's quite an improvement from the old fashioned sweet alyssum in that it flowers all the time. Another tiny flowered annual to think about is this one, which is a euphorbia. This one is called Diamond Frost and it has a cousin called Diamond Delight, which has double flowers and is even more compact. It's worth checking out. And then take a look over here. Another one perfect for hanging baskets really a classic for the hanging basket. This one's called Lobelia Sky Blue, and I just love that blue color, these tiny little blooms. You see, all of those little blooms, when delivered in multitude like that, can really create quite a visual impact, and that's what you're looking for. And these are perfect for hanging baskets. So when you're thinking about creating a container, Think about color, but also think about texture and how that texture might be delivered through the contrast of larger flowers and these tiny little microchips. For beer aficionados, the rise in popularity of craft beers has led to an exciting boom in the microbrew industry. It's these small batch brewers that challenge the conventional flavor profiles and turn beer brewing into an art form. Beer is great because beer kind of goes with everything, um, and everything is good with beer. Microbreweries are, for the past 30 years, they've been in, really in, not just about you know growing business and you know making beer for you know for, for local cities, local communities, and states. You know it's it's also you know it's about growing culture. You know, what it started with was John Beachboard, you know, had this incredible passion for beer. And then to have brewers like Omar and Dylan and John uh, just, you know, coming up with just all these incredible innovations with, with beer and flavors and hops. Hops come to us uh, usually packaged in a vacuum sealed pack. Um, they're very fresh. The trend of, you know, the microbrews that have gone on in the past you know, it, it, this is not something that's, you know, 18 months old, this is decades now. Microbreweries were stifled considerably, you know, in Prohibition, you know, before Prohibition there was, you know, thousands of, you know, local breweries. In the 70s, you know, there were like 10. For the past, uh, for the past really 30 years, the trend, you know, we've, we've had several thousand uh, breweries spring up and I think it's not about it's not just about beer and it's also about just developing you know, culture of you know of communities and then also like what our beer culture is going to be you know for the for the rest of the world there's a lot of, there's there's worldwide interest in American beer now so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check my flow rate here and just to make sure that all the liquid looks nice and clean and clear and this is actually a very clear wort, as we call it, which is very good for us. It means we're gonna extract the maximum amount of sugars out of this beer. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a sample off of our grant here, and I'm gonna check and see what gravity we're getting off the pedal right now. Part of our ever-growing and expanding barrel aging program, uh, we've got everything from imperial stouts and bourbon barrels to this one in particular is the French oak Chardonnay barrel that's got our summer saison aging in it. It's been aging for almost two months. Now is a good time to go ahead and dig in and try it. It's important that we use a lot of 
uh, local ingredients uh, in our beer. We use we use uh, we use honey from in our Love Honey box uh, that's here from that's uh, locally produced. We buy a ridiculous amount of we we have single handedly changed the the honey market in Arkansas from what I hear. We always buy local ingredients. You know we'll we'll do some kind of peach firkin when peaches are in season and. You know, they will use watermelon and blackberries and really any any Arkansas fruit that's in season. Uh, you know, Dylan and John and Omar and, and all these great brewers in here are just clamoring to find the best of what's out there. The reason why it's important is not just for the sake of using, you know, some local, uh, a local peach or a local cucumber. It's, it tastes about 60 billion times better. So. That's, that's, that's why it's important to us, is to have the best tasting product. And you can't, you know, a peach that's traveled, you know, 600 miles is gonna not taste nearly as good as one that was grown a couple miles away from here. What's so special about craft beer is there is, this is a, this is a craft. This is not beer that's, you know, or a product that's that's produced with you know massive machinery and you know computers. Um, yeah, this is this is a this is a beer that you know when you when you look at the process of it, this is a beer that you know we're dialing in temperatures you know minute by minute, literally crafting a product uh, you know day by day, and and it it just like anything else, it's going to change a little bit from here and there, um, but trying to keep it consistent, trying to keep a great tasting product. There's a there's a craft to that just in and of itself. Just trying to keep it, you know, trying to keep trying to maintain, you know, a delicious product. To borrow the words of one of my great heroes, Sherlock Holmes. He said, it's long been an axiom of mine that the little things are infinitely the most important. And I have to say, I agree. You little guys pack a lot of punch. So the next time you're thinking about adding to your home or your garden or any other place for that matter, think about those little details. And remember, some of the best things come in the smallest packages. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. It was my favorite stem. <laughs> I've been watching that one all year. I was gonna use it. So many pollinators. I love that about your garden. Oh, thank you. We raise them. We eat them. <laughs> They're delicious. Have you ever eaten a butterfly? I have not. I do a great butterfly pate. You'll love it.